Hey y'all, we're gonna get started here with this week's, this week, this month's episode of Leap. I'm very excited about our guest this week, Jack. So we're gonna get him up on stage in just a second here and get things going. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. We're gonna get started here in uh, just a few minutes. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm um, coming in here hot from Nashville. Hot, literally, it's like 75 degrees here. I can't complain. Um, and uh, we're gonna get this thing going in just a second. So um, really excited about Jack, who's this week's guest. Um, I've low key been stalking him on Twitter for like a while now, so this is a big moment for me. And as we know, you know, this is all about me. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, um, we'll get Jack here up on stage. Here we go. Come on, Instagram. <laughs> there we go. I'm like, and we're doing it. <laughs> hey. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hang on. Can you hear me now? Oh, goodbye. <laughs> I'll give that another shot. Can y'all hear me? I mean, I assume you'd be blowing up the chat if you couldn't, so. Thanks for your patience, guys. We're just gonna get this thing going in a second. Uh, we're just having some sound issues, unfortunately. There we go, okay, we're back. Oh, I hear something. Oh, still nothing. <laughs> Let's try. Can you hear me? Now I there you go. Hey, there we go. My, <laughs> You're like my headphones I call that... and my AirPods really oh did not work. You know, that's like being trapped in the upside down. You know, it's like it's like you can hear me, but I can hear you, and you're like, let me fuck it in there. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> figured it out. We're here. We got it going. Um, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Of course, yeah. No, it sounds fun. Why not? We can talk about things on Instagram. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick little intro for everybody and then we'll we'll get right into it. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, hey, I'm Rachel Renick. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wethos, uh, which is a platform that helps, it, helps freelancers start and scale their freelance businesses. So make it really easy to price projects, um, bill your clients, and if you're collaborating with others, uh, split payments, call it a virtual studio. It's a thing, we're making it a thing. Um, every month, I'm interviewing different creative entrepreneurs about their journey to taking the leap. Um, this one's guest, I'm really excited about Jack Appleby, which I was just saying before you hopped on, um, definitely been stalking you on Twitter for a while. So it's a big, big moment for me. Um, your first mistake. <laughs> no, honestly, it's the best. We're going to get into it, honestly. Um, but Jack's worked in social for over a decade. He's worked with a ton of big brands, um, across Beats by Dre, Microsoft, Twitch, Spotify, like most of my favorite brands, honestly. Um, and now he's getting back with his newsletter, Future Social, which is part of Morning Brew. Um, which is a really awesome piece around marketing and all things creator and creative. Um, really serving up best in class social and creator campaigns and helping people figure it all out, right? Because this thing's changing all the time um, and marketing is probably one of the hardest things to keep up with. So Jack, again, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, that was all very kind. Uh, yeah, I'm always excited to talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to start, talk to us a little bit about like your actual journey to independence. Cause I know, you know, you were, um, at an agency, I believe you're at RGA, and then you went in house, which are your two totally different worlds, I assume. And then you went and did your own independent thing. So, talk to us just a little bit about the background and how you got to where you're at right now. Yeah, I mean, a lot of luck, a lot of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and then um, a lot of circumstantial stuff. Like, so I got my start at agencies. Like, when I left college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. It was a an old girlfriend's sister who told me. I think you'd be good at social media. Um, my first, first interview out of college was at this little tiny social media agency called The Social Method. That three, 15 person shop, three months into being there, got bought by an agency called Eisenberg Group, where I was at for five years. And we grew a 15 person team to 150 person departments. Wow. Um, and that's where I did a lot of my Microsoft work. Um, we got a lot of my start in video game marketing. Uh, cool. so worked for DC Comics, um, worked for Warner Brothers Interactive, um, ran Minecraft Social for a spell, all kinds of interesting like tech stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then from there, I ended up kind of jumping around to start doing leadership roles at other agencies. Wanted to try my hand at being a director, um, ran strategy teams and departments for a couple different shops um, for another group of brands. Um, and then finally ended up going, uh, moved to New York right before the pandemic started to lead strategy for Verizon through the HCRGA. Uh, and within six months of that was experienced my first layoff. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, blessed Twitter, 12 minutes after I announced I was laid off, Twitch reached out to me and said, would you work here? Uh, Amazing. I, I like, we yes, love it. Yes, I would. Um, so then I went to Twitch. Um, and then pretty much the whole time I was at Twitch, Morning Brew and I had been chatting about, okay, there's just, I mean, the joke was always I was doing a fake Morning Brew impersonation on my own. Like I was in like one of those guys. Uh, and uh, eventually we figured out how to make me a full-time content creator for them. So now I write about social media full-time. Amazing. So, so would you consider yourself independent or do you work full-time at Morning Brew? Like where's that, I guess that line for you, so, both mentally and on paper? <laughs> um, um, so I actually am independent. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually now own Future Social in full. Nice. Um, so right. Morning Brew helps me start it and they've been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and then now I'm running it on my own. So I, now I consider myself independent. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still working through like title wise what that means. Cause like, I'm still in that phase where I get weird about being called a creator. So I call myself a writer most of the time. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, my vision for the next year is write the newsletter, work with brands for my social and then consult where it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I totally get that. And if it makes you feel any better, I guess this is something that we hear like all the time. And it was also something that I struggled with when I went like freelance. And I, we have a joke that's like, if you call yourself a freelancer, you could charge $5. If you call yourself a consultant, you could charge $50. If you call yourself a studio, you could charge $500. If you call yourself an agency, you could charge $500,000. <laughs> so, so real. it really actually kind of comes down to like, however you want to position to your clients, probably at any given moment. Cause I feel like that's constantly in flux. At least yeah, absolutely. that's what we hear. Um, I want to dig in a little bit because I think like one of the things that I really admire about your approach to like social in general is how dynamic I think you're able to, I don't know, bring out different parts of yourself or different parts of your personality based on the different channels. And I think that one thing that I honestly grapple with is like, who am I on Twitter versus Instagram versus TikTok where I'm just like watching mostly, but you know, each of those channels has its own sort of context to it. And it does sometimes feel a little bit like you're, splitting identities or something. Um, like, I guess I just yeah. wanted to get a little bit existential with it for a second and kind of kick off with like, how do you kind of grapple with that? Um, do, is it something that you grapple with? And then how do you think about how that impacts like your strategy moving forward and how you want to remain authentic um, um, while being native to those channels? There's so many, so many pieces of that. Um, <laughs> so let's unpack it. Here well, it's we funny, <laughs> like Instagram is the only like platform that I don't personally use for business. Like this is strictly for fun for me. I post emo music and basketball clips and thoughts on movies. And I've intentionally not used this platform strategically because I have a Twitter following. I have a LinkedIn following. I have two different TikToks with followings. Like I have enough platforms where like this one's strictly for fun. Um, figuring out who I was on the internet, it both came naturally to me. And then I had like a whole, my own existential crisis. Like I, the reason I started making content was I was after being at that first agency for five years. I just realized I didn't know anybody in my own industry. I just knew my coworkers. It's like, oh, I'm just gonna start tweeting to like meet people that work in advertising. Uh, maybe meet some people who can like hire me someday. Um, and then the first time I ever wrote a thread, I only had like 6,000 followers. First time I ever wrote a thread, it got picked up by Buzzfeed and Cosmo and Fox News and all these outlets. Just cause I, I, there weren't a lot of people writing about this. Mm. I was like, oh, there's something here. Um, so then it kind of it became a source of business for me and it was strictly like to your question about like identity it was a very one side of me yeah like for a long time all i talked about on social was social media strategy um content strategy advertising work thoughts um and like that works great for me i built fifty thousand followers on twitter by doing that um, i mean one of my agency jobs every single client that i worked with at that agency was one that i brought in through twitter Wow. Including like Spotify cold DM'd me on Twitter to work with me. Yeah. So like it's been, creating content's been like really, really beneficial for my career over the last, let's say like two years, maybe even last year, I've kind of become just 
a lot more open about the rest of my life uh, and what's going on there. And like, I've, I've always been really interested in life design. I, th I think work-life balance is too much of a simplification because it doesn't actually address what our goals are as people and like what we're hoping to achieve, how much money we want to make, all those kind of thoughts. Um, and I just enjoy writing. I'm, I'm a classic oversharer. I could probably work to pull it back a little bit. <laughs> Um, but it, uh, it does lend itself to just writing. And at some point I started being really open and honest about everything going on in my life. And it seems to resonate with people. And it, and it seems, I think too, the reaction I got a lot of the time was it, it colored who I was to people in a way where it's like, okay, he's not just like an, some advertising guy. He's not some, just one of those other dudes who's like a thought leader or whatever term you want to do. Um, which I think is not, I think it's unfair how, how we throw that at people. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a journey to figure out how to share my voice for sure. Yeah. And we actually have a good question in the, um, in the chat here about, you know, strategically in terms of like being one of the first people to talk about social media. And I know you'd mentioned earlier, you know, when you first got into the space and this happened to me similarly, like when I entered the workforce, um, it was 2013 and my first job was, was an art director. I worked on cover girl and they were like, you're young, you do the, you do the Instagram account. <laughs> So like there I am like literally shooting the Instagram account I'm like 23 mm -hmm. um, and it was like that like early days it was like that a lot and we forget like how short of a period it's been it's only been 10 years since then right and like obviously things have come a long way. So I'm um, yeah like curious in terms of how you think about yourself in the course of that you know digital media the rise of I guess digital media and being like an early adopter to filling the gap around social media that wasn't taken seriously until I don't know. Uh -huh six seven years ago you know i don't think, think i was doing it strategically outwardly mm -hmm. i think uh for me it was as simple as i wanted more of my ideas to get made so i did, i made it a priority to figure out how to sell social media internally mm -hmm. um like i i was confident that my account executives weren't pitching my content correctly and i wasn't nearly senior enough to fight to be in the room so i did everything possible to go be part of those rooms like i took speaking class, I took improv classes, I started dressing nicer, I started trying to shadow people that were more senior than me, because um, I became fascinated by the, I had this idea that I could explain social maybe better than other people could. And again, it was purely selfish. I wanted my ideas to get made more often. Um, and that became part of the shift on Twitter, which is like breaking down complexities in social for, to make it like a little more understandable. Um, and again, like it was mostly because I thought it was just fun there was never a goal to be a full-time content creator that was i never had that vision for myself at all um and just kind of happens maybe because i wasn't so like incredibly focused on it. i was just like doing what match came natural to me as far as content strategy goes yeah yeah and i mean i do feel like there is a lot of like proactive and natural curiosity throughout all of these things that you're talking about right and i and i think that people underestimate curiosity as a really huge strength in just I just want to understand like how does that system work or why is that the way that it is and just like being naturally curious leads to seeing opportunities that maybe other people wouldn't see at least like that's kind of what I'm also hearing I mean right? that is my, like, my, my biggest superpower like the big like who I am as a person is all about curiosity like all I do is read and then read about reading like, I, like, if I go to, a, I, I always joke, like, don't go to a movie with me, because if we go to a bar afterwards, I'm just going to be reading five hours of articles <laughs> about said movie. Um, and, like, and I've, I've enjoyed socials since I got in the industry. I found, I find messaging to communities fascinating. I find the way people represent themselves on the internet fascinating. So I just consumed a ton of it um, and really spent a lot of time theorizing about it. Like, why does content perform? Um, like, one of the things that, Something I see on like marketing Twitter that just drives me absolutely insane is people go, I don't understand, like I can never predict what goes viral on TikTok. And like it quite literally, if you work in content strategy, it's your job to know how to do that kind of stuff. Like, and to me, virality is not an accident. Like it's something that can be manufactured and that doesn't mean it's inauthentic. You can do all, like I've recreated it with brands. I've recreated it for myself. Like that's part of the gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, what I'm hearing you say is that like that natural curiosity gives you the strength enough to, to really unpack, like why, what are the patterns that we're seeing in things that are working versus not working? Like that pattern recognition and being able to pull things apart, simplify it and then recreate, like 
I love that process. It's such a it's satisfying fun. Like, like, process. Yeah. And it's funny. We think about TikTok and the For You page as like, like that is the most incredible algorithm we've ever seen as far as content delivery goes. It's better than YouTube. It's better than Netflix. It's amazing. But what it's it also, me. sorry. <laughs> I said it's, it sees me and it's deep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, one of my favorite party tricks is making everybody pull up their phones and show the first five TikToks. At the beginning. Oh, my God. I'm on Capybara talk right now. And we don't even talk about this right now. But, like, <laughs> it would be weird if I did it's, that at this point. It's so incredible. <laughs> um, but the thing that I think is so amazing about that, too, if you work in social, is it's literally showing you what content is performing at a global scale. Hmm. It's giving, like, the, the the algorithm is giving you not only stuff that's for you, but like it's custom for you. But at the same time, there's a reason we all see the same video still because there's certain global greatest hits yeah. and you should be able to look at that content and break it down and understand what best practices are being used there to generate results. I really believe that. Yeah, I mean, it is by nature formulaic, right? Because it is an algorithm. So like by nature, it's picking up on certain patterns and signals and things in the videos. And I mean, yeah, I think people I think people overestimate how much of a black box it is, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, totally. when in reality, it, it really does just kind of like digging into the analysis of it and looking for those patterns and the formulas in there, I think. Yeah, know. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, shortly after we finish up here, I'm giving a talk to a, a Syracuse social media class and the talk nice. is on how there's only two best practices. Like there's all, we can learn all these ratios and time frames and all this stuff. All that matters is do you have a great creative idea and do you have a great creative and you can do, if you have both of those covered, you can do almost everything else wrong and get massive results. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You're at Syracuse University? Yeah. I, I, I went there, actually. Oh, funny. And I'm from Syracuse. Yeah, I'm like a full-blown townie, so. Oh, funny. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got, got, got to that. Yeah, I'm trying to do, like, more. I, I love working with students, so I got offered to do, like, a guest lecture. I was like, oh, absolutely. That's awesome, man. That's so cool to hear. Um, so in terms of, like, your own independent business can you can we unpack just a little bit around like your journey to independence what that's looked like for you um i'd love to talk about the title situation like what are you thinking about when you're thinking about what to call it or what to call yourself or oh, how does it how do you unpack that i mean the journey to independence is terrifying <laughs> i never I, from a very early age it seemed like i was going to be on a cmo path or like running a strategy department like a cso type of role um, I showed a lot of aptitude for it early. It seemed like it was, it, it was going to be the very obvious path for me. Um, during pandemic, and partially because how the world has changed, like I do not like work from home. I do not like managing people from home. I think it's incredibly hard to teach people from home. And it really encouraged me to like rediscover what I enjoy about this industry. And the reality is I enjoy doing the work. I love coaching and teaching. Like I'm, I'm doing this thing right now where I'm giving away free career coaching sessions every day in February, and March to anybody in the first five years of their career. Cause I love doing mentorship stuff, but I don't love managing. So what I wanted for was for my full-time role to be more like in the tech world, they called it in, uh, independent contributor mm -hmm. where like when I worked at Twitch, I went from five years of running strategy teams to going to a senior creative strategist role that paid me significantly more than when I ran teams at agencies to just do the work myself. And I had a blast. It was so much fun. I was making three decks a week of creative ideas for how brands can work with creators there. Um, and eventually just what became clear through these last couple of years is candidly, there's just like, there's a lot of money to be made on the independent side. Um, the only reason I'm going independent now, like with my life is because it's, financially irresponsible for me not to like i i like working with teams i i love having collaborators and the biggest fear for me is that i'm now like there's only one person in my business it's me and i'm debating if i wanted a manager or like a project coordinator or a pm of some sorts or assistant. but uh no working by myself was never the goal because like i love collaborating with people. yeah but like now it's it's, it's just worth too much it's that simple I love that. I want, I like, oh my God, I want to like play that sound bite every morning when I wake up. Like it's financially responsible to not be independent, but it's true. Like I think right now, you know, there is a lot of money up for grabs out there. I think a lot of people are spending in this space in general. And like I said, I think it is just really about like how you're framing yourself and your services to the client and the types of clients that you're, you know, like going after. But 
I've totally, been... I mean, this is, this is one of the things I really push for in social is I think more transparency for, for salaries and jobs and the realities of it, um, as well as bigger talks about what you can accomplish in that space. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of people that work in social that are really taken advantage of and have to work way too hard. I also think there's a lot of people who don't realize that there is, there are ways to get paid significant money in social media. Mm -hmm. Um, like when I was at Twitch, I cleared a $200,000 salary to do creative strategy ideas on one salary. Like, and that's a pretty specialized job, but those jobs do exist. And if you, I was somebody who prioritized financial, like that was big to me. And there's a lot of jobs that I really hated that I took for strictly money reasons. There's other people who might want to go strictly based on subject matter or type of role. And there's no wrong answer to this stuff, but I don't think there's enough conversation around if you want to go like, like the different, like trigger tree of cool, I can go make X amount if I'm willing to give up ABC or vice versa. Yeah. How did you think about translating what you were making in a full-time role to being independent? Like, were, are you doing, are you doing more hourly based? Do you lean more like value-based pricing or flat rates? Like how, how did you translate that? So when I do consulting, um, the best advice I got was to always sell projects. Um, so Amen. I really, tr yeah, I really try to flat, like, and I, and I'm very lucky. Like I, I built an audience for myself. So almost all of my consulting work is inbound to work with me. I have to pitch myself very often. Um, and I can charge a premium for it. So I'm usually pitching my own projects. Um, I'm usually pricing them out myself and telling them what the delivery is going to look like. And I've had some, like, I'm still new to it. Like it's in the last six months that I've been doing this, but by doing it that way, I'm able to kind of value my own time as I see fit. Um, and for being honest, I'm probably twice as fast as they think I am a lot of the time because I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. And I don't want them to have the right to tell me what I'm worth per hour. I want them to tell me how much the project I'm doing is worth yep. for them. Yep. Yeah, I t could not agree more. I mean, so much of even our software is built on this premise. Um, like, you know, when we first published our library of um, templates and, date and like data around how people are pricing, we publish our own data first from our own like freelance agency. And it's so um, important that like, you're not only like breaking all that down for the client, but what you there, said there at the end, take the price tag off of yourself and put a price tag on the work, helps you kind of like remove yourself emotionally, I think, mm -hmm. from this idea of like, how do I put a dollar amount on my worth? Like as a person, you know, like how do you just slap $1 on there? Like it's, it's not um, nuanced enough. And it creates a, le a like a layer of, or a lack of, I guess, objectivity to which like we make decisions based on our emotions of how to price, like what I think I'm worth or how I feel mm -hmm. about myself worth versus like, what is this worth? What is this work worth to my client? If I'm making oh. a logo for my client and it's going to be on literally everything that they have, every owned property, how much is that logo worth? Is it worth $5 or is it worth $500 or is it worth $5,000? Well, and I think that's what so, we're thinking about, like whether you're doing freelance work or if you're just even interviewing. Yeah. Um, it, it's like, don't be wrong. You got to back into like dollars per hour at some point. Like I asked around, like, what are people getting paid? Um, I heard on the senior end, people are going to pay like, like a $1,500 day rate is a, is a very high day rate, but it does exist. Oh yeah. So I just decided I'm like, I'm not, you're not getting my work for less than that. And some people have the brands I really want to work with. Uh, but I think something really important with both the pricing of freelance and when you're interviewing, if you're at the point where they want to work with you, give the high price, give the, don't, don't negotiate with yourself, give your, the price price that you want or you think you deserve and like the price like the common advice that's a lot is like your price should scare you a little bit yeah. <laughs> because if you're far if you're far enough down a discussion no one's going to ghost you or walk away from you because of your price they're going to give you feedback on the price and then that allows you to decide is this worth it whether it's a full-time role or a freelance project totally totally and the psychology around that around pricing and price anchoring too is is interesting in that way too especially in the services business because I actually lost is a lesson I learned one day. I lost a bid to my old agency when I was independent and I came in at uh, 50,000. They came in literally at yeah, like half a million or something like that. Crazy. We lost that contract and we lost it because our price felt too good to be true. Right. Me. And it's like, yo, I used to work there. Like literally it's the same talent. It's a service-based business, it's the same talent, but like you're paying a 
inflated price mm -hmm. for what reason? And so the lesson there though was absolutely like, if you shoot too low, then that can also have the opposite effect. It's not like everybody's just going to say yes to that, especially in this business. They're going to think like, who like is this person going to be high quality there? You know, they get, it doesn't pass the same test. You have to be careful with that. Like, and, and like, again, this is a, this is like, it's a confidence thing. It's a being willing to have conflicts thing. Like it's really important if you want to go make money for yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, so I wanted to ask before we get to our last question around, um, you know, folks who are going to be taking the leap or maybe just took the leap. I just want to ask, like, a lot is changing in a lot of ways, <laughs> like from, I don't even know, AI to crypto to what's happening in the marketing world to the algorithms changing. Now it's real. No, no more reels. We're going still again. Whiplash. What do you think if you had to say in the next 10 years in the field of, I guess, like marketing or branding or creative is going to change? And what do you think will actually stay the same? I think the big thing that's happened, I mean, it's happened in the last two weeks and it's going to continue happening is all of these social networks really want to work off of interest graphs instead of social graphs. So Ooh. for anybody's not familiar with those, traditionally, like over the last decade, social networks were built off of social graphs, meaning the content you received in your feed was generally based on the accounts that you follow. Basic social media, Facebook, Twitter, like the way Instagram used to work. TikTok was one of the most prominent interest-based graphs mm -hmm. where it understands like at a base level things like hashtags, but really it understands psychologically like, like what you're consuming, how you consume it, what content you engage with, uh, whether it's just through like view time or even just traditional engagements. And TikTok's like <laughs> time spent in app destroyed every other app in social media, like by threefold. And this is where like when make Instagram, Instagram again became a thing and then be real had its hot mm -hmm. moments. I was just kind of laughing because like, guys, like the problem's not that these apps are moving away from this. The problem is you all like TikTok more than you admit and your friend's content isn't that good. Like most people <laughs> just don't, like, like most of us regular humans <laughs> do not have that many interesting things to say with much frequency. Yes. Like Instagram is so boring to me. I find it like horrifically boring. Like when people joke <laughs> about like, oh, I see baby announcements and I see like, like engagement announcements. Like, yeah, because those are significant life events that people actually engage with that then gets through the algorithm. Yeah. Like you don't want to see, like you don't want to see your favorite influencers. You want to see more of your friends. Like stop following the influencers then. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but what we're seeing now is like obviously Instagram Reels is, is uh, interest graph based. Twitter now has a for you feed. They're trying to go, and the Twitter's been trying to crack this for years. Yeah. They were just really bad at it before. And now they're getting, I don't know if they're, they're getting closer, I would say. It's the so intention far. is clear, at least. The intention is clear. Before it was not clear. I was like, why am I seeing random things in my feed? And I don't know. Yeah. Like super um, but that's going to keep happening. Like, and I, it, it does make it, it does call into question where I think the value of followers is going to continue to drop. Mm -hmm. And, the, and this is funny, it's where I hear so many social media professionals like bemoan TikTok and how they're like, it feels so random. I feel like I don't know what's gonna perform. Or like another one of the, the greatest hits that I see that drives me nuts is, don't you hate it when that video that you spent hours and hours working on doesn't perform, but the one you thought of last minute that you just filmed real quick performs? Like, like guys, this is our jobs. We need to be able, like, be able to do this. And can't like a kind of hot, take but like if we're all paid to be content professionals whether we're strategists or creatives or whatever and all these social networks are going more interest graph mm. that should lend itself to us that should be music to our ears because we should be able to make better content than anybody else out there so i think we just have allegedly <laughs> allegedly like and that's where i just think that's the thing that we have to focus on it's like we got to keep making better content and we got to be very honest about what is and is not good content. Yeah, that's such an interesting way to frame it in terms of like the social graph versus the interest graph. And like, I mean, TikTok is like YouTube meets like Instagram, I suppose. It's like kind of sort of combining the nature of both. But at the same time, you're totally right. Like when I see somebody I know on my TikTok feed, I'm like, ha, ah! <laughs> like, oh, you know, because I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I <laughs> like this is this is like early TikTok. Um, I was working at I won't say what agency or client I was working with a client who had a video series and this predated me getting there um, that they spent like four or five million dollars on the content 
Um, and it was on their YouTube channel. And it was, it was meant to only live on YouTube channel. Strategically, it made sense. It was a brand that probably had no reason to have YouTube followers. They had an idea to make a type of content for it. Um, when I came in, I was like, oh my God, I didn't know I was inheriting this thing. This thing is hot garbage. And the videos were getting hundreds of views. And I was like, guys, how, what's, how is this possible? And I knew the content was bad, but like, how is this possible, guys? Like, and they're like, well, there's no paid yet. I'm like, you should accidentally be getting 10,000 views on these videos with the size of brand that we are. Mm -hmm. Like, really what you told me is you've strategically misunderstood your subscribers so badly and even just basic social media algorithms so badly that the whole world has rejected a $4 million content series. And <laughs> it it happens so all the time, unfortunately. All the <laughs> time. I mean... I'll call out one brand that I worked with. Like I, I get more phone calls about my time with Beats than any, any, or any brand I've ever worked with. And I made more pointless content at that job than any job ever. Hmm. Why do people call, call you about it? They're just interested in Beats. They're yeah. just curious to hear what that was like. Um, and like, listen, I mean, I did a lot of stuff I'm really proud of there. Like I worked an NBA finals campaign, uh, worked with some of my favorite basketball players of all time. Um, but I also produced a lot of like, Athletes in a locker room, slow pan up to them, PO over them with like smoke coming up. It was like it was fake Nike commercials that were living on Twitter and Instagram. Like it was, this is harsh, but like I felt like I was making pointless content. They're just mini commercials and there wasn't anything social about them. Mm. And it's like people like, like these big brands, they love to spend money. And I think only recently, like in the last couple of years, are they learning to love social? I agree. I completely agree. I feel like I know not. <laughs> now it's gotten so meta though that like now when you see a brand being like like having a personality personality you know and like and then the brands are like responding to each other and it gets into like it's like it's it like unravels. it's, it's like, people. Uh, uh, yeah. it's like it, it, there's a lot of brands that jump the shark um the i'm personally really anti the snarky brand thing i think it's far more targeted to one specific audience than we admit. Yeah. I hate when we call it like internet voice. Like, I'm sorry, everyone uses the internet, not just Moon like our Twitter <laughs> people. Yeah, not, not just Elon and his homies. Like, <laughs> so like, I think Wendy's crushed it because they were the first and it was really unique yeah. that they did that. And then like, now it's like, like, I don't know guys, like, is this actually driving results for your business? Or are you just getting random likes? Cause haha, the brand's doing this. Like is actually driving goals and like also just be more strategically clever and creative than like just copying the same brand tone over and over again. Yeah, that's actually, so in terms of like, like copying shit over and over and over again, I feel like that's one of my biggest struggles with content creation is like getting bored of the same formats over and over again. And I guess I'm curious in terms of what won't change. Does anything come to mind for you on the creative marketing side? Um, you mean as far as like content trends? Yeah, like over, over the next 10 years, you know, we're gonna, I totally agree on like the whole like interest graph <clears throat> versus social graph moving more towards that. I also think like the multimedia sound video that is going to continue to grow. Um, is there any trend that you're seeing or that has been true, I guess, for the last 10 years that you think will continue to be true? Um, so I'm a big fan of Mr. Beast, both the creator and the business. Um, and I think I try to consume pretty much everything his team puts out because I think they're just the best in class as far as content mm -hmm. goes. Um, and I was watching there his manager, Reed, do an interview on Colin Samir, uh, where he's talking about the value of the person who engages with short form versus long form content. Um, and this is more creator based than brand based. But he's talking about how he go to VidCon and TikTokers with 10 million followers couldn't fill a room in person. Mm. But YouTubers with 10 million followers had lines out the door. Musicians have this problem too. Yeah, like it's, it's this, uh, what is our relationship with the creators? And I think the, you, I mean, you'll hear me talk a lot about, we will learn more about content from creators than brands. Like I fundamentally reject that we can't do what creators do on the brand side. I think we just choose not to. Um, I think, I think the thing that I'm, that's besides that tangent, I think the thing that we're going to keep seeing is there's going to be more and more content in the world. Like it, one of the reasons content 
not performing, like content performance drops, is not because you're being throttled. It's because there's more and more incredible content out there and you're losing the battle. Yeah. It sounds like uh, the, the, those two fundamental rules probably won't change either, right? I really think so. Like, I think it's, it's I just, you'll, you've never once heard me say like, fuck the algorithm. It's never come out of my mouth. Like, no, my job is to beat the algorithm and make content that performs. Like, and I've had plenty of flops, like for sure I've had flops, but I, I don't know, we're getting paid to be like, have very fun jobs. So I, I definitely get a little bent out of shape when I hear people blame things on the job, like blame things on like the realities of the job. Yeah, I mean, similar to, I think the debate around AI, you know, like, will this, is this detrimental? Is it a danger? Or will this push us to be even better? Like when, you know, no longer standardized test taking makes sense or just writing a dry essay that you can generate with AI makes sense because anybody could just generate that. And instead education is pushed towards like creative problem solving or real time contextual problem solving things that actually meet what we need in a world that's moving this quickly. Like there's also the argument that these types of things can push us in the right direction in that regard um, mm -hmm. by, you know, essentially making the baseline either way easier or like way harder like if you're trying to beat the algorithm the yeah. content is so much more competitive like you have to raise your bar and you have to keep raising that bar and it's kind of a similar narrative around so if you can't beat that's what my copywriting bot yeah. like you, you yeah. know like the human mind is like a deep vessel well, of creativity so coincidentally my newsletter tomorrow is about exactly that is yeah. on how to use chat gpt to aid you in your job because yeah. it's an incredible tool like incredible. it's incredible incredible like for this phase of my career, I use it for a lot of like checklisting things. Mm. Like I rationally know, like I know my fundamentals, I know what to go to. But if I type in like, give me 30 content ideas about something, it'll produce five things that I've forgotten are content trends. Like that thing's powerful. It's amazing, um, yeah. Like my newsletter tomorrow is, I basically had to build a fake brand mm. and it worked way better than I thought it was going to. Like I knew I it was good that. and it worked even better. <laughs> I, oh my god, I'm really looking forward to reading that. Yeah, like, I know, I, I use it, I say I use it to get rid of my blank page syndrome, which is like when you're staring at a blank page and you're like, oh, so much anxiety, and you're like, draft me an outline for blah, and then like, it takes so, you have to work, rework it a lot, mm -hmm. because it can't just come off the shelf, but I think um, helping, like, organize those thoughts or just get started, anything that helps you just get started is like, super valuable, I feel like, just Great. overall. <laughs> um, so look, one last question before we um, depart for the evening, which again, thank you so much for all the time and all the advice and, and all the insights. I mean, I just feel like this was super, super valuable for everybody. So really appreciate that. Um, there are a lot of people going freelance right now, whether it's by choice or not, um, given you know the layoffs, the economy, which seems to be maybe in a recession, we're not sure. Um, what advice do you have for folks that are looking to take the leap or maybe just kind of took the leap, not by choice? <laughs> I mean I'll caveat that I'm far from an expert in that space. Like it's pretty new to me too. Um, I think creatively marketing yourself is just really important. Um, like for me, like all, like I said, all mine is inbound. And that's because I spent the last, like in one year I built a LinkedIn following. And I think that's where- Yeah, LinkedIn's lit. Yeah, LinkedIn's the best. Like it's, it's, it's a complete career hack. This totally. Um, but, uh, Think about, about how off, like, really consider if you're new to it, let's talk about like saving 30% of the money you're going to make for this wonderful thing called taxes. Uh, let's talk about the lifestyle you're trying to build for yourself. Because like me personally, I'm not trying to work 80 hours a week. I, I'm a big believer in, for me, I want to work 40 hours, maybe 50. I want to maximize my per hour earnings. And there's lots of ways for me to do that. And then really enjoy my life. There are some like, there's a couple of like very prestigious jobs that I turned down because the pay wasn't right or the lifestyle wasn't right. And like, it was pretty easy for me to turn them down. Like, like even one was like truly like a dream job for me to run my favorite basketball team social. I was like, nope, that doesn't provide the lifestyle that I'm looking for. So I think when you're starting out freelancing, just really consider how you want to spend your time like what the, like what your inbound versus outbound is. If you need to do more outbound, how you're going to go find those clients um, and just understand what it's like to run your own business. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think just like even doing some of that outreach ahead of time, you know, if you have the choice, if you're making the, this, if you're doing this by choice, I mean, we, I think we were sort of seeing clients for like a good six months before we really like my co-founder and I like really, you know, went in and started um, and went full time with it and quit our jobs. But I feel like um, that's getting a basis like that and just getting a lay of the land and understanding things. Like one thing that I've heard over and over again from like the 70,000 freelancers on our platform is everyone does it a little bit differently. Um, so oh, yeah. there is no right answer really, but I think you find what works for you, um, and figure out a way to repeat that. Well, and that's been my biggest hurdles. Like I've got a lot of fear of freelancing. Like I've got some money trauma from my, some family stuff in the past. Like, I mean, I have a very expensive invoice that I need to send that I just haven't sent. Cause like, it makes me uncomfortable. Totally. It. Like it's just like a psychological, I totally get that. you're like, Oh, I'm my tummy here. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I mean, the thing that I'm working through is there is no like right, right way to do this. Like, like do the basics to get, put yourself like legally and in tax situations that make sense. But then just, just listen to your clients. Like if, if you're already talking to them, you're not going to get burned for doing it with your format. You're not like, like they will have discussions with you. If you're just be actually, that's the, that's my big one forever. Just be easy to work with. Mm. If you're easy to work with. Like you'll be able to make as many mistakes as you want. Yeah, peace of mind. It's, yeah. it's good. It's, it's it's a great thing to sell. Just peace of mind. Like, don't worry. We're gonna we got this. We're gonna get this done. Definitely. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Jack, thank you again so much. If folks want to follow along, if they want to subscribe to the newsletter, if they want to follow you on the channels, on the socials, where is the best place to do that? Um, look me up on LinkedIn. It's, uh, my my name is Jack Appleby. Uh, and you'll see. I think the subscribe link's on there. I hope it is. That's where I publish most of my content now. Um, I'm obviously on Twitter too, at, at Jappleby. Um, and then if you just Google, actually don't Google my newsletter right now. Just follow me on social and I'll be tweeting out new links that are going to a new version of the newsletter. Um, but yeah, give me a, like, hit me a reply, like send me a message, like always down to talk to people about this kind of stuff. Amazing. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, appreciate the kind words in the chat. This was an awesome conversation. We'll post a recap. We'll do all the, you know, the cutting and the posting and the things. Um, but uh, we'll be back next month with another, another episode of The Leap um, towards the end of March. I'm like, what month is it? Yep, towards the end of March. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody after an adventurous, well, we're not going to go to South by, but I am going to, I'm going to pop by Austin just for, a, just for a second. Are you going to South by? I'm not, not this year. Man, I think it's expensive and crazy, isn't it? Well, well I'm going to hang around the wings. <laughs> um, all right, folks. Have a great evening, everybody. And we'll see you back here next month. Jack, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. See you. Have a good night.